Welcome to AccuWeather's Ask the Experts. I'm your host, Jeff Cornish, and here we go beyond the forecast to give you the how and why on all the cool and interesting things you've ever wondered about and wanted to ask about in the world of weather, space, and science. Today, we're going to tackle some weather folklore. These are tales, sayings, maybe myths about the prediction of weather and its greater meaning. And the truth is there are endless examples of sayings and writings of clever ways to think about the weather. And joining us to talk about some of these things and how accurate they may be is expert senior meteorologist Dave Dombeck. Dave, thanks so much for joining us. Oh, it's my pleasure. This is uh, it's, it's a neat topic. Like you said, it's a very interesting topic and it goes way back to the colonial days, you know, when people spent a lot of time outdoors. A lot of people were farmers and they observed the weather uh, very carefully. And you and I were talking about this a couple of days ago. It's almost like fuzzy math in a way where things like uh, some of these phrases that we're going to talk about may not always be precisely true all the time, but most of the time they generally do work out pretty well. And before we talk about some of these uh, weather folklore examples, we do want to talk about you, Dave, and your experience over 40 years here at AccuWeather. So what keeps you coming back for more? What gets you excited about the weather? Boy, I mean, we'll use the term, and, and Jeff, you're very familiar with it. The uh, I'm, a, I'm a weather weenie. Uh, I love the weather, uh, and I have since I was a little kid, and that passion is still there. Uh, and that's really what keeps me driving every day uh, of my life. And uh, uh, I've seen a lot of uh, a lot of things over the years and a lot of, uh, you know, technology is certainly way different now than it was back when I was coming out of uh, Penn State and just starting my career here at AccuWeather. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I just I love forecasting the weather and tackling uh, the atmosphere and the old adage, uh, even a perfect forecast, the best you could ever do is tie the atmosphere. You can never beat it. You can just uh, <laughs> get a tie. And that's a that's a humbling uh, thought. That's good. I like that a lot. Well, we're going to get right to this, Dave. So the first bit of weather folklore that we're going to discuss today is uh, a very classic one uh, is the old adage, red sky at night, sailors delight, red sky in morning, sailors take warning true. Or is this just an old wives tale? Yeah, well, think about this, uh, Jeff, when, when uh, you know, this whole like the red sky and, and, you know, the colors in the sky, oftentimes what's happening there that the light from the sun is is going through particles um and in this case a lot of times it happens to be uh ice crystals cirrus clouds very high level of uh, moisture and as the light goes through it refracts and it, and it goes into the different color patterns and oftentimes it would be red or oranges or whatever and if you uh see the you know the red sky at night well where generally is the sun you know at evening it's setting in the in the western horizon um and so you see that, and and it could could be a day where maybe there was it was stormy, it was cloudy, there was rain, snow, you know, something going on, and then finally that system is exiting, it's getting out of here, and it's getting ready to clear. And so as the sun is setting, you may not have seen the sun all day, but right at sunset, it's you're starting to get some drier air and break up of the cloud cover, and it, and it creates that nice red sky, and that means the next day you could actually have dry, fair weather. Um, kind of the opposite in the mornings. Um, you know, it, it's coming up, uh, the sun is coming up in the east, and, you know, maybe it was it was clear all night or most uh, partly cloudy. It was a, it was a dry, uh, quiet night weather-wise, but you've got the next system, next uh, disturbance or storm or whatever coming in from the west, and so that, as, as the sun is coming up, it, it's starting to get that refraction and, and the coloration and everything in the morning, and that's kind of an indication, okay, uh, heads up, there might be a storm coming. Precipitation could be uh, arriving here sometime today or this evening or whatever. Something is on the way. So I think that one, there actually is a lot of credence to uh, to that saying. And uh, I often think about cirrus clouds around the fringes of large storms, but if the clouds are too thick, closer to the horizon line, uh, maybe that's closer to the heart of the storm system. Uh, next on our weather folklore list, does a stripe on the back of a woolly caterpillar indicate the severity of the upcoming winter? You know, I worked uh, in Toledo and in Erie, and in between those two markets is Cleveland. Legendary meteorologist Dick Goddard was huge on this for many years, and I think that he uh, has most of Ohio thinking that this is totally true. Is that the case, though, Dave? Boy, I don't know. I, I think this one is just one of those uh, fables. Uh, honestly, I don't know if there's any meteorological... Um, you know, back up to that one, Jeff. I know as a kid, I used to get really excited when I did see, find a, 
a woolly bear. I loved winter weather as a kid. And if I happened to find one that was like all black, I would get really excited that we we're going to have a, a hard winter and lots of snow. But yeah, I, I don't think there's a whole lot to that one. All right, all right. Well, this uh, legendary has been pop legend has been very popular uh, in many parts of the Midwest and the New England states as well. Uh, and you can read some of these uh, statistics here, or at least notes on uh, the legend. The longer the black bands, it was believed that the snowier, the colder, and more severe the winter might be. But uh, Dave says it may not be a whole lot of credence to this, but it's a fun one regardless. This is a good one here, and I think you're going to be on board with this. When dew is in the grass, rain will never come to pass. So what say you about this, Dave? Well, the thing about what caused uh, the dew to, to occur in the first place, uh, usually you get dew, you get its condensation. Water condenses, uh, water vapor condenses on grass and, you know, whatever outside, sometimes on your car sitting in the driveway. And it usually occurs, and it and it seems like it's the dew is at its peak um, amount late at night and into the early morning hours, right up around and just past uh, sunrise. And so, for you to get that dew to form, you had to have had pretty good conditions for the temperature to drop to the saturation point the night before. Um, and how does that happen? Probably the skies were clear, or mostly clear, or no worse than partly cloudy. And that means that, yeah, maybe maybe down the pike some, maybe, you know, tonight, tomorrow, whatever, another storm front, whatever could be coming in with precipitation, but probably not right away uh, because you're just coming off of a, a mostly clear night that allowed that dew to form. And maybe even some calm winds, too, which might uh, suggest maybe the absence of a big storm nearby as well. Good stuff. Right. Well, our next bit of weather folklore, wind in the west, weather at its best. What do you have to say about this one, Dave? Um, well, you know, I think this this is one of those, and I know you and I were talking about this just the other day, Jeff, that um, I think this is more of a regional um, uh, old adage, and, and I think it certainly works well in the eastern part of the United States. Uh, it doesn't work well on the West Coast where, you know, what's to the west of them, the Pacific Ocean and, you know, and storms coming in and things, you know, it's a whole different situation as you go other parts of the country, but I think, you know, and again, a lot of these go back to colonial days. So, you know, the United States really was the 13 original colonies. It was in the eastern U.S. Um, and let's say for Philadelphia or New York City or Washington, D.C. or Boston or whatever, a wind out of the West, that means generally that air is, you know, again, there are exceptions, but it generally means drier air is coming in that, uh, you know, a lot of times it could lead to more sunshine, that the air downslopes and comes downhill uh, it warms up and dries out coming over the Appalachian Mountains. And oftentimes it's just a sign of, you know, a storm pulling away, maybe behind a cold front or behind a departing uh, storm. And the wind goes into some westerly component. And that generally means dry weather, uh, particularly uh, east of the Appalachian Mountains in the, let's say, the I-95 corridor. So, you know, again, for a regional uh, thing, that I think that that one's pretty good. And I think it works quite well. That's kind of a fun point there that the geography of uh, of the people who originated this phrase is very, very important uh, as uh, people in uh, Seattle, Washington may not say the same thing as uh, as you said, in Baltimore, Philadelphia or, or New York uh, about that one. Well, let's get to our first viewer question now. And this comes from Jamie in Delaware. And Jamie writes, I remember hearing or seeing folklore about some kind of hurricane calendar. Have you guys heard of that? And if so, can you share some details about some kind of a hurricane calendar? Yeah, and I, I know that there uh, there was a, a calendar, uh, in, and I think it came from, uh, might have been the old Farmer's Almanac. And again, I think this is a good rule of thumb, um, certainly for the Atlantic Basin. Um, you know, obviously the, the official uh, hurricane season in the Atlantic Basin is June 1st to uh, November 30th. So it's the, in, in, that, the, in that time frame that we're looking at. And um you know, it, it, it goes to show you, yeah, you could get exceptions. There have been tropical storms. There have been, you know, oddball things that have happened, um, you know, throughout history. And certainly in recent years, you get named tropical storms in January or February, whatever. But in general, it's, uh, you know, it's a case where as you ramp up, my rule of thumb is, yeah, you could get some some storms, some, some uh, you know, some rogue storms, some um you know, you, uh, an occurrence of one or two early in the season. But 
really, once you get to the August and especially mid-August, let's say August 15th to about September 30th or maybe October 5th, that's really the meat of hurricane season. You're going to get most of your named tropical storms and hurricanes during that time. And it goes ramps up very quickly and then it also ramps down quickly after that. That's great information there, Dave. Uh, so far, we have uh, a lot more to talk about, though, in our next block coming up. So coming up, we do know the saying it's raining cats and dogs. But what about fish and frogs? And in our weather wise segment, yeah, that really happened. We're going to let you know how this weird weather event actually did occur. But up next, the conversation about weather folklore continues. What causes a halo around the sun? We're going to answer that and more of your viewer questions when Ask the Experts continues. Welcome back to AccuWeather's Ask the Experts. I'm your host, Jeff Cornish. We're having a lot of fun today talking about weather folklore with Dave Dombeck and uh, weather folklore, some of these writings and sayings that you read or hear about with the weather. Uh, and Dave's a great expert to help us break this down. He's a senior meteorologist here at AccuWeather, 40-year meteorologist and employee at AccuWeather. So, Dave, uh, we want to get to our next bit of weather folklore, a halo around the sun or moon means that rain or snow may be coming soon. So what do you say uh, about uh, halos in general? Before we really dig into the folklore, uh, what causes a halo around the sun or moon? Well, it's it, and again, it goes back to what we uh, talked about earlier. It's that uh, refraction, the bending of the, the uh, light rays, whether it's from the moon or, or from the sun. And it's, it's going through, that light is going through ice crystals. Um, kind of the same process, whether it's a raindrop or an ice crystal, whatever. You ever get, like, in your backyard, you get the hose, um, you know, on a, on a sunny day, and you can actually see, like, a rainbow thing. And it, it's it's the same principle. And, you know, of course, it's not getting into the technical details of why that is and how it happens or whatever. But basically, it's just light being refracted through ice crystals. And you think about... You know, when a storm is coming, you've got, let's say you have a day, it's beautiful sunshine, dry weather, quiet weather, nothing going on. But, you know, a storm is coming. And where's the first place um, when moisture starts to show up? Uh, in general, there are exceptions, but where's the first place where moisture starts to show up in the atmosphere? It's way, way up there, way up in the, you know, 30,000 feet or so up at, at, at cirrus cloud level. And so that's why when you start seeing that moisture coming in at that high altitude, then you get that the halo, you get that refraction of the light and everything. And so that is actually a very good predictor. And oftentimes, um, us meteorologists, we use something called skew T log P diagrams or soundings, as we call them. And it's actually a profile of the atmosphere from top to bottom of where the moisture is and so forth and temperatures and winds. Um, but one of the things we look at is the first place you're going to see moisture showing up is way up top. Uh, and that's an indication of the atmosphere moistening up. And it's just the start of that process. But it it tells you that something is on the way. So a stamp of approval that in general, uh, that uh, ring around the moon or the sun is typically an indicator that we do have some kind of a storm heading our way. Our next bit of weather folklore, a year of snow, crops will grow. What do you say about this one, Dave? Well, I think that's uh, pretty, you know, pretty self-explanatory in my opinion, because I mean, obviously snow is, you know, it's frozen precipitation, but if you have wherever you are um, in, in the country, wherever you are in the world, you've got um, a situation where you've had um, average snowfall, you know, about what you would expect, or maybe even more so, uh, maybe it was a, a snowier than average uh, uh, season, um, that you know, the ice crystals, the snow eventually melts and, and that moisture goes into the ground. It goes into the water table and everything. So certainly uh, coming out of the winter and into the spring months, unless you had too much moisture, that's a whole that's too much of a good thing. But it, in general, it means you've got a, a good sufficient amount of moisture in the soil uh, for crops to grow and, and, and thrive, uh, certainly early in the season after planting season in the spring and into the early summer. What happens later than that, that's more of a wild card, but I think generally that one's a pretty good one. I'm on board. At least a healthy start to the growing season is a good thing there if you have a decent amount of moisture. 
uh, at least in the soil. All right, Dave, well, next, you can tell the temperature by counting a cricket's chirps. What do you say about this one? I absolutely agree with that, and I could I could vouch for that when I've been out, you know, camping and just out in the backyard and spending time outdoors. And you, I mean, you just observe that on, on a really warm, muggy night, the temperatures are holding up. Those crickets, or it could be katydids or other other kind of insects that you could hear, and they're making a sound at night. Um, it really does make a big difference uh, in in the the uh, the frequency that they're chirping, that they're making their sound. The warmer it is, the faster they're going. When it gets cool, you have a, a, a kind of a cool or chilly night. You could still hear them, but they slow down. Their pace definitely slows down, and and that that is absolutely true. And and in fact, somebody even um, came up with a formula of how you know you get so many chirps per minute and you there's some kind of calculation factor and you add this to divide by this whatever it is i don't know what it is but you could probably google it but uh, you could actually it, it actually works very well i've tried it and that that estimate of the temperature is actually pretty good that's pretty amazing that's great stuff uh, it's a nature's thermometer if you will well, it is time Absolutely. for another viewer question, Dave, and this one comes from Peter in Michigan. So Peter writes, one weather saying that I heard growing up was ice in November brings mud in December, almost as if uh, maybe a cold late fall reverses into a milder December. So how true is this one? Well, I think, um, you know, and again, there are exceptions, but I think more often than not, Jeff, that that works out because let's face it, you know, in November, the uh, the average temperatures are still they're dropping quickly, but you know you're, it, it's still fall. It's not winter yet, and so if you get an unusually cold air mass that just rushes in and it's just way way below what it should be, it's just way colder than it should be in November. You can't maintain that. The atmosphere just you can't maintain that extreme cold. And so if you happen to ice up your pond or lake or whatever puddles in your backyard, chances are. That's that ice is not going to last there. It's a different story if it's happening in December or early January. A totally different uh, situation then. But oftentimes that cold and the things freezing up, it's just too early. And then inevitably it's going to warm up, even if it warms up back to average or warmer than average. Um, that's going to melt, and you're going <laughs> to you're going to have the mud, as it says. All right. Uh, that's good stuff there, Dave. Well, this is not folklore, but truth. We have run out of time. So thank you so much for your expertise. We always enjoy talking to you, Dave. I love seeing you here uh, on the operations floor, and it's nice to have you on the show. So thanks again. Well, coming up next in WeatherWise, we're going to share weird and wild stories, including how it rained fish and frogs in this segment we're calling, Yeah, That Really Happened. We'll be right back after the break. Welcome back to AccuWeather's Ask the Expert. It is time for WeatherWise in a segment that we call, Yeah, That Really Happened. We're going to look at interesting weather events that they may seem unbelievable, but they actually did happen. And in this, Yeah, That Really Happened, we know it does not actually rain cats and dogs, but have you ever heard of animal rain? This is a real meteorological phenomenon where flightless animals fall from the sky. So while it is very rare, there are cases where a strong water spout, essentially a tornado over water, can pick up fish, frogs, or other creatures, typically small, in a powerful updraft. And as the storm moves, they're dropped from the sky along with the rain, sometimes miles away. And there are examples in history as far back as a 16th century engraving, and also as recently as in 2021. Look at that. There are fish all over the street. Just, they just fell out of the sky. So Ted Stone was walking his dog in Texarkana, Texas after a rainstorm and found fish on his street. I've heard of this happening, but I've never seen it with my own two eyes. And this is crazy. There's one right there. They're everywhere. Pretty wild. They were everywhere. And so, yeah, this really happened. It sounds incredible. Animal rain is no fish story. Thank you so much for joining us here on AccuWeather's Ask the Experts. I'm Jeff Cornish. And don't forget, when you have a question about weather, space, or science, you can write us or send us a video question at asktheexperts at accuweather.com. You can also call us at 888-566-6606. Have a great one.